If you've watched any cartoon within the past 20 years, chances are you've heard at least one character voiced by Mr. Tom Kinney. Tom Kinney isn't only one of the most talented voice actors in the industry, he's also one of the most frequently used. From Nicktoons to Cartoon Network shows to everything in between, this guy has a wide array of characters spanning various channels and franchises. Hey guys, I got sparks! And his characters can be found all across the morality spectrum. So, which Tom Kinney characters are the most heroic and which are the most vile? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is Tom Kinney Characters Good to Evil. As we said, Tom Kinney has voiced a ton of characters, easily over 200, so we can't mention every character. We're only going to be focusing on his most well-known roles and most memorable performances. We'll be focusing on main and side characters, but we may include a couple of fan favorites. With that being said, let's get this Tom Kinney ranking started. As always, we'll be starting our list with the most pure characters and working our way down. These characters are the good. Getting our gold medal of good is SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob is probably Mr. Kinney's most famous role, as well as the most popular. Okay, now they're perfect. <laughs> and honestly, who doesn't love SpongeBob? Though naive, childish, and overly emotional, SpongeBob still has a heart of gold. He cares about his friends and is always going out of his way to do good and make others happy. While Fry Cook may not be the most glamorous job, SpongeBob's just happy that he gets to help feed people delicious Krabby Patties. Even when he's annoying Squidward or accidentally causing trouble, SpongeBob will try to correct his mistakes and make things better. He's also saved the day a few times through his specials and movies, like when he saved Mr. Krabs from King Neptune's wrath before rescuing the people of Bikini Bottom from Plankton's mind control or when he defeated Burger Beard. While troublesome without realizing it, this sponge doesn't have a malicious bone in his body, and for that, we had to give him our top ranking. In second place is Val Hallen, the hero and Viking god of rock from Dexter's Lab, specifically the Justice Friends segment. Together with Major Glory and the infragable Krunk, he helps protect the world as a superhero. Though he may give off heavy metal vibes, Val Hallen is actually extremely chill. He's also the most level-headed of the trio, never getting too emotional or overreacting in comparison to his teammates. A good example of this is when he tried to convince Krunk to see a dentist when he had a toothache, despite Major Glory's unfounded worry. Additionally, he's one of the strongest heroes in the Dexter's Lab universe, just as long as he has his mighty axe. Although we don't see much of his actual heroics in the series, Val Hallen is a nice guy and an awesome god. His only negative moment was in the Powerpuff Girls episode, Members Only, where he sided with the rest of the members of the Association of World Supermen about not having the girls join their team. But this was a small mistake that he was able to learn from. Ranking third on our list is Eduardo from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Though he isn't a superhero and can be a coward, it's Eduardo's heart that puts him this high. While it's common to see Eduardo running away or crying when in danger, he'll put on a brave face and step up when one of his friends is in danger. This was the role he was created for after all, being a big and strong protector while also being kind and gentle. Eduardo also has a soft spot for cute creatures, whether it's a stray imaginary puppy or a swarm of imaginary fleas. In terms of morality, he's up there with Wilt as one of the most good characters of Fosters. His only not-so-great moment was when he lied to some of the younger imaginary friends, telling them stories about how cool he was and taking the credit for many of the things that Blue did. Thankfully, he comes clean, and the kids accept Eduardo for the great guy he is. Up next is Gibson from Super Robot Monkey Team Hyper Force Go. Gibson is a team scientist and genius, and is very proper compared to his teammates. As part of the Hyper Force, he helps protect Shugazoom City from threats like the Skeleton King. Gibson is loyal to his friends and cares about them. Though he's sometimes more of a teacher than a friend to Chiro, he still comforted Chiro after his battle with the Sunriders. Gibson can admittedly be proud, especially when it comes to his super genius, and thus can come off as arrogant, never wanting to admit when he's wrong. He can also be frustrated when dealing with those who are incompetent and not as smart as him. Your shame should be the least of your worries. But even while being impatient and condescending, he's still a good guy who will do anything for his friends, as well as a true hero. 
Following him is another genius monkey, Dr. Rockwell from the 2012 TMNT series. While he had a rough start after his mutation, Dr. Rockwell is indeed a hero, being one of the mighty mutanimals where he uses his genius and telepathy to help on missions. While he doesn't get too many moments to shine, when he does fight, he's both protective and skilled. He alerted the turtles when Zog first arrived on Earth, and he and the other mutanimals also helped protect Karai when the Super Shredder came after her. Similar to Donatello, Dr. Rockwell can be arrogant about his intelligence and dangerous. Thankfully, Dr. Rockwell isn't looking to hurt anyone and focuses on trying to help others through science, as well as through his new mutant abilities. Next, we have Raimunda Pedrosa from Xiaolin Showdown. With the power of wind at his side, Raimundo is one of the Xiaolin dragons. Raimundo is a slacker, being laid back and avoids his chores, and even mischievous at times. He also hates to lose and rushes into action without thinking. Still, he's committed to being a Shaolin warrior, and according to the Bird of Paradise, his greatest quality is kindness. It should also be noted that in the episode Dreamstalker, it's revealed that his lazy, jerkish attitude comes from his fear of not being good enough and letting others down. This is shown when things get serious. He's willing to work hard when he needs to and will learn from his mistakes. He'll use his tricks to his advantage, getting the upper hand over his enemies, and will take extreme measures if it means saving the world, even if he has to drink the Lao Mang Lone Soup. Though he may tease or argue with his friends, he still cares about them. At one point in the first season, Raimundo temporarily joins the Halen side and is given everything he wants once he helps resurrect Wuya. However, once he realizes how lonely he is without his friends, he traps Wuya and returns to the Shaolin Temple, having since matured. At the end of the original Shaolin Showdown series, Raimundo actually becomes the leader of the Shaolin Dragons, showing how far he's come. Next is Mission Hill's Wally Langford. Wally is notable for being one of the first positively portrayed gay characters in animation. He's also a nice guy. Formerly a famous film director, he now works as the projectionist at a classic films-focused movie theater and is married to Gus, who owns the local diner. In the episode Plan 9 for Mission Hill, Wally tries to teach Kevin about classic movies, and the two start to bond, with Wally even starting to think of Kevin like a son. Despite how much they may argue, Wally cares a lot about Gus, to the point where Wally was willing to risk his own movie and directing career to give Gus a chance to act, with the movie, as Kevin says, being a valentine to him. And although originally embarrassed about the movie that made him a laughingstock, Wally says that he actually didn't regret his decision to make the movie with Gus instead of a big star, if only because it led to the life they had together now. Even if Wally is still a minor character, you still have to admire him for that. Up next is Dog from Cat Dog. Being the complete opposite of his brother Cat, Dog is happy-go-lucky and lovable. While someone like Cat may let power or greed get to his head, Dog is more of a pacifist and has an easier time enjoying life and being thankful for what he has. There was one occasion where he became a bully, but that was mostly due to Cat's encouragement as well as the Chaco shakes that he was drinking, messing with his personality. Dog can also be oblivious and insensitive, not always realizing how much his careless actions can affect others. I want to surf so bad I can taste it. In fact, there are several instances where something Dog does causes Cat to get hurt or beaten up, so we can understand Cat's frustrations with him. It's not like Dog does this maliciously, he just isn't the most observant. There are also times where Dog will help others, like when he tried being the superhero Mighty Dog, and it's often his optimistic nature that'll encourage Cat to look on the brighter side. While he comes off as the younger sibling, we'd still say that he's a good influence on his feline brother, as well as others. For being a rich kid, Eddie from Class of 3000 thankfully doesn't live up to the stereotype. Although he's wealthy, he never acts entitled or spoiled. He does, however, struggles with relating to his classmates. He once claimed that he's never had any bad days when he was learning about the blues. In that episode, at least, he was able to learn a lesson about counting his blessings. In another episode, he was confused by the term chores and didn't know how to use a broom. While he may not know the value of a dollar, we still see throughout this short-lived series that he cares about music as well as his friends, never putting himself above them just because he has more money than them, and often uses his money to help them. He's also never used his money in a negative way, showing that he still has morals. Though a snarker and a coward, he's still a nice kid. Carl from Johnny Bravo is a geek. 
Acting as both the local genius and wacky neighbor to Johnny, Carl is annoying. He's also eccentric, but friendly, even to someone like Johnny, who's more or less a jerk to him on a regular basis. While he'll help Johnny, Carl will also force Johnny into his own plans, like when he made Johnny cosplay with them. Though Carl sees Johnny as a close friend nowadays, it was revealed that he actually used to bully Johnny when they were in middle school. Not a good look, but at least he grew out of it and has become nicer and protective of Johnny. However, that doesn't mean they don't still argue or fight when Johnny pushes Carl to his limits. In terms of friends, Carl's probably the best that an arrogant guy like Johnny is going to get. Next is Heifer from Rocco's Modern Life, one of Tom Kenny's first roles. One of Rocco's best friends, this guy is a goofball. Although dumb and slobbish, he cares about his friends and loves having fun and enjoying life. Next is TV and snacks. Unfortunately, he can also be a loudmouth, as well as lazy and immature, so he can be frustrating to deal with. At his worst, Heifer can be selfish and obnoxious, and while he gets along well with Rocco, he'll fight with their other friend, Philbert. Thankfully, he just comes off as an airhead who can still be a good friend. Wrapping up the good, we have Hugh from Final Space. Inspired by the HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, Hugh was formerly the prison supervisor for the Galaxy One, where he looked after Gary during his five-year sentence. Thanks to Kevin, he's able to operate independently from the ship as a robot. Hugh can be stern and strict, and can be forceful when Gary gets out of line. Speaking of Gary, the two disagree a lot, with Hugh doubting his plans and disagreeing with how impulsive and reckless Gary can be. Despite the friction, Hugh sees Gary as a friend, even being able to see his good side. He kept Gary company during what was thought to be his final moments, promising not to leave him and admitting that it was an honor to be his friend. As the series progresses, assumingly from Gary's influence, Hugh loosens up and is more lenient, and though he struggles with self-worth, he still grows to be a worthy member of the team. That does it for the good guys. Now it's time to delve into the more neutral. This is the gray area. Starting off this section, we have Sumo from Clarence. Although he may seem scrappy and rough around the edges, Sumo is a good kid. Being a wild card, he can be unpredictable, usually doesn't think before he acts, and is absolutely fearless, which often leads to him going along with Clarence's crazy ideas. In some instances, he almost acts like a wild animal. While he's loyal to his friends, he'll struggle getting along with Jeff due to how much of a neat freak Jeff can be and how boring Sumo thinks he is. It isn't always easy for him, dealing with 12 siblings and being a middle child. He'll act out by being rude and is a troublemaker. Even during these rougher moments, he'll stand up for and by his friends. There was also the episode, Bird Boy Man, that showed him taking care of an injured baby roadrunner. Although he has maturing to do, we feel he does enough to be on the edge of the gray tier. Up next is Squanchy from Rick and Morty. Squanchy is one of Rick's best friends, even if Rick doesn't feel that same level of friendship. He was even part of a band with him and Bird Person. Much like Rick, he enjoys drinking and crashing parties, thus being known as a party animal. Additionally, he can be violent, as we see in The Wedding Squatchers. In that episode, he was willing to fight and even sacrifice himself in order for Rick and his family to escape. While this was a good moment, this is also one of the only scenes we get from him. Being a minor character, it's hard to judge his morality. But given that he hangs out with and admires a guy like Rick, we could infer that he likely has a similar morality level to him. Without any proof of that, we feel that we have to put him safely in the gray tier. Ranking far above his boss is Slinkman from Camp Laszlo. Much like The Simpsons' Mr. Smithers, Slinkman is Scoutmaster Olympus's right-hand man. Being the more intelligent of the two, Slinkman helps keep Camp Kidney running smoothly, although he still has to answer to Lumpus and obeys every order. Along with being obedient, Slinkman is also loyal and kind. While some may see him as a pushover, other scouts can appreciate that he's at least nicer and more fair than Lumpus. Slinkman also has a soft spot for the scouts in general, especially Laszlo and his friends. Although he's mostly a yes man, Slinkman has his limits. He had a breakdown when Lumpus refused to give him a day off to go to Slugfest. Slinkman also pranks Lumpus on June 9th every year as a way to get back at Lumpus for forgetting his birthday. These instances, plus him working so closely with Lumpus, drops his ranking. But given how moral he is in comparison to Lumpus, I think we all know who we'd rather have running the camp. 
Of course, we couldn't forget the mayor from the Powerpuff Girls. After all, he's the one who always calls on the Powerpuff Girls to come and save the day. Unfortunately, that's the most useful thing he does. And he'll even call on them for trivial matters, like helping him open a pickle jar. He's childish and a ditz. As a mayor, though he may care about the citizens of Townsville, he's still incompetent, often needing Miss Bellum to keep him on track or help him with his mayoral duties. His morality is also gray, especially when it comes to his wife, given that he was willing to trade her away in exchange for his porcelain poodle. In another episode, he tries to fight crime without the Powerpuff Girls by using a hot air balloon with a boxing glove, but he injures innocent people. So even if he was trying to help, he causes trouble. Though oblivious, bothersome, and dangerously incompetent, the mayor isn't a bad guy, just a bad mayor. He still cares about the Powerpuff Girls and Miss Bellum, as well as the city, so we'll cut him some slack. Cupid from the Fairly Odd Parents is next. As the god of love, you think this guy would be higher up, but nah, he's a jerk. The first time we meet him, he's being bribed by Mama Cosma to make Cosmo fall in love with a different woman. That's messed up. In his next appearance, he's teaming up with the other holiday mascots to get rid of Santa by banishing him to the non-existent date of February 33rd. Granted, this was after several weeks of having Christmas every day, so we can understand his frustration, but it was still attempted banishment. You've jingled your last bell, Bob. There are also his parties where he invites godparents and godchildren to go on scavenger hunts, which really just amounts to doing his shopping. It's hard to call him a villain, given that he still cares about the nature of love, and with the exception of the incident with Mama Cosma, usually tries to pair people who would work together and genuinely care about each other. Next is Jake Spider Monkey from My Gym Partners A Monkey. Jake is Adam's best friend, although we're not sure why. For the most part, Jake is destructive and careless, and kinda gross filling the slot of the dumb best friend. He often causes trouble for Adam and the rest of the students of Charles Darwin Middle School. He can also be lazy, selfish, and dramatic. When it comes to his best friend, Jake is also possessive of him, and though it's sweet in a way that he cares so much, it also comes off as overbearing and creepy. Despite this obsession, Jake doesn't act like a friend towards Adam and hardly ever shows some respect or loyalty. Often when they're both in danger, Jake will focus on saving himself before helping Adam. In Basic Jake, Jake got Adam sent to detention all weekend for something he didn't do. In another episode, Jake kept Adam awake all night, which ruined Adam's date with his crush the next day. He also once used the power of shiny glass doorknobs to hypnotize and control other students. While Jake isn't the worst student in a school filled with other annoying and dangerous animals, he's far from being best friend material. Finishing off the grades here, we have the Ice King from Adventure Time. Once upon a time, this guy was a fairly serious threat. Although the characters regularly acknowledged that Ice King was insane, Finn and Jake would still take him seriously whenever he tried to kidnap one of the princesses of Ooh and force them into marriage. His ice powers and warped sense of logic also made him destructive, and he wasn't the nicest to his pet penguins, having a short temper. But after the Christmas special, we saw a whole new side of him. As it turned out, the Ice King wasn't only more tragic than viewers once thought, but also a lot nicer. Before the Great Mushroom War, Simon was an antiquarian and was in a loving relationship with his fiance, Betty. Even after the Magic Crown started to change him into the Ice King, Simon still showed humanity by taking care of a young Marceline and being a father to her. He's kind and self-sacrificing, and he only ever wore the crown in self-defense and to protect himself and Marceline. Though he eventually completely forgot who he was, that kindness was still in him. While the act of stealing princess parts to make himself a princess wife was bad, Ice King was still kind towards his wife, repeatedly telling her that she was beautiful and wanting to make her happy. He tries to help Marceline, even if he doesn't completely remember their past. In the series finale, Simon's body and mind is restored thanks to being inside gold, and he's able to move on with his life no longer a villain. While he was an antagonist for much longer than he was a good guy, we of course have to acknowledge that it was completely due to the crown's influence, and even at his worst, he still had lines that he wouldn't cross and could be a decent guy. He may have been the show's first villain, but Ice King is far from being a bad guy. Finally, we've come to the truly villainous and the wicked. These characters are the bad to evil. Starting off this list, we have Tom Kinney's most recent role, Stuck Chuck from Kid Cosmic. 
For the first half of the season, Chuck is deemed as the bad guy. He wanted to collect the stones of power for his great leader and was willing to do anything to accomplish this mission. Shut up! Give me the stones or die! From attacking kids and holding them hostage, to tricking the local heroes to take him to his ship, to even mocking Kid for his tragic backstory in order to manipulate him, Chuck would take every chance he could to be a jerk, having no issues with insulting Kid and his team and making things difficult for them. However, after his great leader was defeated and revealed to be a coward, Chuck started changing his tune. Without a leader or a goal to fight for, Chuck began to see Kid in a new light, admiring him for his bravery and determination despite all Chuck had put them through. As such, he was willing to work together with Tuna Sandwich to rescue the rest of the local heroes and save Kid. He quickly became a part of the team and was willing to give up his translator and speak without it, something that's painful for him as a penance. Fuck. Sorry. Because of this redemption, we're putting him just on the edge of bad. We can't ignore all the awful things he did, but we do appreciate that he's trying to be better. Dr. Two Brains from Word Girl is next. In a show full of villains, Dr. Two Brains is the one we see the most. A kind-hearted but distracted scientist, he was turned into a villain after a botched experiment left his mind merged with an evil lab mouse known as Squeaky. Fellow villains, take her down! He now spends his time coming up with ways to appease his rodent mind's hunger and urges. As such, nearly all of Dr. Two Brains' schemes revolve around cheese. Though his schemes don't pose the biggest threat, many of his inventions can cause trouble. He also go to extreme lengths to prove himself as a true villain if his reputation is ever threatened. However, as much as he's a villain, Dr. Two Brains can do good. Before becoming Two Brains, he was once an ally to Word Girl and had a strong morale. And although his lab accident changed this, he's willing to team up with her to help defeat a bigger foe. On one occasion, he stopped another villain, Victoria Best, from destroying her. Two Brains also cares about his henchmen, acting as a subversion to the typical villain. Unfortunately, this softer side doesn't stop him or his evil mouse from also being hostile and harsh to others. This guy is, unfortunately, still a villain, but we can give him credit and put him in the lower half of the bad tier. Up next is Night Brace from Codename Kid Next Door. Representing one of the biggest fears a kid could have, Night Brace is all about dentistry and oral hygiene. He's obsessed with this field and with clean teeth, and will make sure innocent kids are cavity-free. Before he was a villain, he resorted to using extreme methods to clean teeth and was kicked out of dental school for trying to put braces on babies. While a minor villain, he still causes trouble for the K&D. His obsession with teeth hygiene also doesn't earn him too many allies on the villain side, as seen in Operation Munchies, where he tried to destroy the last box of Rainbow Monkey cereal despite everyone else, including fellow bad guys, wanting it which resulted in him getting beaten up for his troubles. He's not the worst, but he's still an invasive supervillain, so he felt he deserved a decent ranking. We knew this guy was coming. Next is Scoutmaster Lumpus from Camp Laszlo. Lumpus gives Scoutmasters everywhere a bad name. He's easily annoyed and angered and doesn't seem to care for the campers at all. He's grumpy, stingy, stubborn, and has a huge ego. What's one of the few things that makes him happy? Ruining the fun for the other scouts, especially scouts as obnoxiously happy and positive as Laszlo. He'll also use scouts to get fame and glory, like when it was revealed Clam was a genius and he wanted to use Clam's musical skills to get on TV. Although he considers Slinkman a friend deep down, he'll treat Lumpus as awfully as he treats everyone else. In the series finale, he was revealed to not be the real Scoutmaster, but rather a lunatic that tied up and hid the real Scoutmaster, who may or may not be Heifer, away for the summer. While this twist came out of nowhere, it should still be acknowledged. Even if this ending was just a gag, Lumpus is an awful guy and belongs in the bad tier. Turtles beware, next is Alberto from Rise of the TMNT. No, this isn't Freddy Fazbear, though he's about as dangerous. Originally being an animatronic that sang songs for kids' birthday parties, Alberto was able to break out of his programming thanks to short-circuiting and became a villain. I'm gonna crack you open like a birthday pinata. While he was only in two episodes, this guy was memorable. He mostly focuses on attacking humans who have wronged him not caring if they're innocent or if they're only kids. In his second episode, 
He tries to lead a robot revolution against humans, and is nearly successful with how easily he and his fellow bear bots are able to take over a local amusement park. While creepy and a threat, Alberto has a soft side underneath all that metal. He treated Baxter Stockboy fairly when Baxter helped him out. He was also touched by Donnie and the other turtles giving him a proper birthday, and was willing to stand down long enough for April to bash his head in. Because of this, and the small impact he has when compared to other TMNT villains, we're willing to cut him some slack. Entering our top 5, we have Mumbo from Teen Titans. When he isn't using his magic to bring the Teen Titans into his pocket dimension and turn them into helpless animals, he's using it to steal cash and jewels. He was also part of the Brotherhood of Evil at one point. Like most villains, he's selfish and self-serving, with just a touch of magic-induced insanity. While still a minor villain, Mumbo is also powerful and uses his power against innocent people. Next is Scaramouche from Samurai Jack. One of the standout characters of Season 5, Scaramouche became a fan favorite. Though he may come off as goofy and happy-go-lucky, being more focused on making quips and doing silly dances than on battles, Scaramouche is still a serious threat when it comes to his skills as both a musician and a fighter. Like many other villains in this show, Scaramouche is a bounty hunter who's after Jack, and he's just as relentless. He was once known as Aku's favorite assassin and was given the nickname Scaramouche the Merciless. He lives up to this title when he massacred an entire town of innocent people and only did this to draw Jack's attention to him. He also cruelly mocked Jack when he saw that he lost his sword and tried to relay this news to Aku, which would have been a death sentence for Jack had he not reclaimed his sword in time. While his arrogance, his lack of threat after his initial appearance, and his more comedic nature keeps him from being ranked any higher, we have to respect his reputation and heartlessness. Getting our bronze medal of evil is Commander Peepers from Wander Over Yonder. As the commander of the Hater Empire, Peepers is all about that evil lifestyle. Married to his job, he gets a thrill and power rush out of taking over planets and ruling the universe, even if he isn't able to do it on his own. I got wonder. He plays a huge part in the Hater Empire's efforts to conquer every planet in the galaxy, thanks to his well-thought-out plans and intellect. He also wields a laser blaster. Peepers is also harsh to his fellow watchdogs, physically and emotionally abusing them and not caring much about them personally. The only person Peepers cares about is Lord Hater, but even then, it seems conditional. He'll care about Hater's safety and well-being as well as their friendship, almost taking on a parental role. But he also seems to at least partially see Hater as a means to take over the galaxy, and will look down on Hater for some of his more annoying traits. He'll occasionally team up with his enemies, like when he teamed up with Sylvia in order to take out Dominator. While you can admire Peepers for being determined and resourceful and even having a soft side, these traits don't take away from how cruel and evil this little eyeball can be. In second place is Otto Octavius, aka Doc Ock from Ultimate Spider-Man. Yeah, Tom Kenny voiced one of the most famous comic book villains, as well as another one coming up. I am the twilight of your creeping existence. This version of Doc Ock doesn't differ too much from other versions, and is about as evil as they come, and is regarded as one of Spider-Man's worst enemies being frequently seen throughout the series and even becoming the main antagonist in Season 4 when he teams up with Hydra. He's a mad scientist, with his main goal being that he wanted to use fear to gain respect for himself. He even says, with great power comes great fear, and with great fear comes great respect. As such, he threatens Spider-Man, or Peter Parker, and is even willing to threaten Aunt May. He also doesn't care about anyone but himself, claiming that caring about things only bogs down the mind. Even his greatest creation, Scarlet Spider, he only sees as a tool. However, towards the end of the series, Otto redeems himself a little. After Spider-Man saves Doc Ock by curing his giant octopus mutation and making him realize the error of his fear equals respect mindset, as well as showing him that the two of them aren't so different, Otto decides to help Spider-Man save the other heroes and even turns himself in. Even if Otto tries to deny that he's good, Spider-Man seems to believe that there's still a chance. Considering that this redemption comes at the very end, and we don't know whether or not he actually does become better, we can't give the Doc much credit, especially not in the light of all the other evil and destructive stuff he did. Still, that tiny bit of good keeps him from our top spot. At our top spot, we're ranking Oswald Cobblepot, aka The Penguin, from the 2004 Batman cartoon. 
As far as penguins go, this interpretation is certainly one of the most unique and underrated, with Tom Kenny's voice work making him sound more malicious. Oswald was one of the first villains Bruce met in the 2004 cartoon, being entitled enough to turn to crime in order to restore the Cobblepot name to its former wealth and glory. Originally just coming off as arrogant and rude, his darker side is quickly discovered. With this version of the Penguin actually having a rivalry with the Pennyworth family, he nearly feeds Alfred to his birds. Batman was able to stop him, but the thought of a fate that painful is enough to send shivers down your spine. Because of his bitterness towards his family and how they lost all the money that he would have inherited, this penguin is much crueler as well as a much more serious threat thanks to his martial arts skills. He was able to outsmart and betray Catwoman, threatened to blow up a children's hospital, and nearly unmasked and killed Batman while on camera. He also nearly killed Batgirl and at one point even tried to put together his own team of fellow villains, though that wasn't too successful. Even if he's comedic, I mean, when you're voiced by Tom Kenny, it's sort of a given that your character is going to be funny, Oswald is still a villain at heart. Though he cares for his pet birds, unlike Otto or Peepers, the Penguin doesn't seem to have any hint of a possible redemption or even much of a soft side. Because of this, we feel that he deserves to be given our Gold Medal of Evil. Alright, but what do you think? Let us know in the comments if you agree with our ranking, and tell us which series you'd like to see next. Be sure to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil series, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite cartoons, shows, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.